I announced in advance that I thought perhaps a report on lobbying and lobbyist activities in Washington might be of interest. Frankly, the suggestion comes from two sources. The first one is that I was asked to author a very short piece for one of the Sunday magazines on the general subject of lobbying. And the other comes from the fact that the Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate is presently conducting something of an investigation into the activities of so-called foreign agents, meaning those who are registered as agents of foreign principles. There's so much said about it and so much written from time to time that I thought perhaps it might be well to spell it out for you and put it in uh, a single package. Now, there has grown up a peculiar, sinister connotation about that word lobbyist. You think of him as some sinister, skulking creature who is sneaking through the corridors of the Congress and buttonholing people and making representations and perhaps misrepresentations in behalf of some pending matter or in opposition to some pending matter. Of course, the word derives from the fact that in connection with nearly e every legislative body, you have some kind of a corridor or a hall or a lobby. On the House side, they call it the Speaker's Corridor. On the Senate side, it's the Marble Room. But the fact of the matter is that these corridors are not open to the public. So if you want to see a senator or a congressman, you send in a card and get him off the floor into the reception room where all the world can see. But it grew up out of that word lobby, and I assume that at some time or other, this hall or corridor was open to the public so that if a member came out there to take a smoke or to see somebody, why, others had ready access to him. So that's how the term lobby and lobbyist developed. Now, there have been a lot of tall tales in connection with lobbying. I remember some of the older members of the Congress when I came here in 1933 would regale me on occasions with some of the things that happened about parties on a, an excursion boat going down the Potomac River where there was plenty of food, plenty of liquor, probably they had some uh, unattached ladies aboard and they would give this party for the legislators in order to get a chance to talk to them. Or it might be a party in a ballroom at one of the uh, local hotels. Or it might be some uh, other venture. But in any event, the whole purpose seemingly was to be able to influence members of the House and Senate with respect to pending legislation of some kind. I referred to them as tall tales because I have no way of knowing whether they were true or not. I just accepted them at face value. I must say in all the time I've been in Washington that I haven't seen anything like it. The only party that runs in my mind that you could call a lobby party was probably back in 1936 or 37, but it, it was a boresome party in many respects. It was given at a man's house in his basement, and they had quite a number of congressmen and senators present. I remember we had a very good state dinner, and they were called together for the purpose of discussing a bill that had been introduced by a distinguished congressman from Indiana relating to what was known as the Long Short Haul Clause in the, the Interstate Commerce Act. When the dinner was over, and there were only men present, uh, somebody opened the meeting, and uh, there then ensued a two-hour discussion uh, of this bill. Some of the most distinguished members uh, in both House and Senate were on hand. It was one of the most enlightening discussions I'd ever heard, and I think I got more out of it than if I had read several books on the general subject. But when it was all over, everybody went home, and that was it. But it came to light that there was such a dinner, and there was a great to-do on the front page of the Washington papers. That's the only one uh, that I can remember that would probably fall in that class. And it was anything 
but in the tradition of the old lobby parties that they used to talk about. Now the fact of the matter is that lobbying today is quite a different thing. A lobbyist really calls himself a legislative representative. He could be an engineer. He could be a scientist. He can be a lawyer. It might be two or three people or more. Uh, who knows? But there's this about it. He is expected to know his business. Now, sometimes senators who are no longer senators and congressmen who are no longer congressmen are engaged for that purpose. So they can come to your office and see you. Or they can get you out into the light of day in the reception room and there talk to you and give you their views and their version about some pending piece of legislation. But he's expected to be a very knowledgeable person and know what it's all about. His information is supposed to be authentic. And then in addition there too, he is expected also to come before a committee and to testify. Sometimes they get out press releases that they issue to the press, radio, and TV in the belief and in the conviction that they've got a story to tell. Now, all this is uh, not so surpassing strange, all things considered. Think of the deep intrusion of government into the affairs of people. Think of the range of legislation today. Taxes, as an example, spending, the whole field of agriculture, the domain of the West. Why, it's absolutely endless, and somebody is bound to be adversely affected by the proposals that are made. As an example, when we finally get around to hearings on uh, the so-called tax program, I uh, venture to say there'll be literally hundreds who will make application and they'll want to be heard on the subject. And you may call them lobbyists coming to influence legislation. Now you see, a lobbyist as such must register. Back in 1946, we passed the Legislative Reorganization Act. I was on the joint committee of senators and congressmen who prepared and got that act enacted, and I had something special to do with the so-called anti-lobby title. That was my particular dish. And there we provided that anybody who comes here for pay to, for the purpose of influencing legislation must register with the clerk of the House of Representatives. And so, do, so today, literally hundreds of people are registered, former senators, former congressmen, and a great many other people. And so they, be, they come as legislative representatives to represent an interest, be it a group interest or an individual interest or whatever it is. That's why I say so-called lobbying has been brought right out into the open and everybody is pretty well identified. But that, now there's another dimension to that, and that is those who represent a foreign principle. That could be, for instance, a foreign corporation or a foreign individual or it could be a foreign government, and they must register under a special act known as the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Instead of registering with the clerk of the House of Representatives, they register with the Department of Justice. That first act was passed way back in 1938, and in the main, its purpose and its motive was to catch up with those who came here to plead some special ideological cause. By that I mean Nazism or Communism. We wanted to find out who these people were, and the only way you can do it was to finger them and to have them register on prescribed forms and tell about their activities, how much money they got for it, what their expense allowance was, and so forth. So that act has been on the books for a long time. It's been modified a little, but the hearing that is presently going on is uh, designed to elicit information to determine whether the Foreign Registration Agents Act ought to be tightened up or not. Now, it's not singular either 
that uh, foreign interest should have people over here to represent them. Consider for a moment the Marshall Plan, which goes way back to the 40s, when we made it a relief program in the first instance. Obviously, foreign governments who were in distress wanted to get their full share, and what to do better and more logically than to get some capable person here in Washington to represent them and to see that their interests, their needs, their desires were properly represented. We went then from there to the European Economic Cooperation Administration and to other var variations of the Marshall Plan. That embraced military as well as economic assistance. And it's not surprising that they should have people to represent them and come before the committees of the Congress to present their viewpoint. And then it took another turn. The Congress passed what was known as Public Law 480. That's its official designation, but it deals with the disposition of billions of dollars worth of surplus agricultural commodities. We provided these commodities could be made available to foreign governments to be sold to their people. Then they would roughly divide the money and they would have half of it to spend. The other half was spent under our direction and instruction for things of military value, like roads and docks and bridges and so forth, because the deal was that usually we had military bases in those countries. And then we went even further. When we uh, finally put the Sugar Act on the books long ago, they developed spirited competition from offshore possessions, the Philippines, Hawaii, the Virgin Islands, the Latin American republics and others, as to how much of a share they would get in the American sugar bowl. You see, we use roughly about 10 million tons of sugar a year. If they could get an extra 10,000 tons or 20 or 30,000 tons, just think of what it meant to the economy of a little country. So what happened? Very often they hired somebody to come and present their cause. Cuba had a man at one time, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, uh, and a great many others. So that stems partially then from uh, what we do for foreign lands and the interest they have in our affairs and in what they can sell in the American market under American law. So foreign agents uh, serve quite a purpose, I must tell you. And the question is whether they get out of hand, whether they get into sinister avenues or not. And those are matters that the Congress has got to explore. But as a general thing, I think it can be said that since 1938 on the foreign side and 46 on the domestic side, lobbying has very much been brought into the open where all the world can see. Thank you so much.